great story. I am the president of Balcony Training Japan. And you are actually group three for doing project management. So it's proven to be a very popular program. And I think from the feedback I've been receiving, something very practical. And this is one of the elements of Dale Carnegie Training. We are not a heavy textbook, heavy case study type of training organisation. Uh, your reality is what makes the case, actually. So we try and structure our manuals in that vein. And also, uh, it's very practical. What we're trying to give you here is something you can use immediately. So what we talk about things today, we're going to be in three sections. We're going to do project planning. Then we're going to do a very detailed orientation on actual management of the project. And then we're going to look at some decision-making techniques as a group. Because as a project team, you have to make choices. You have to make decisions. What are some ways of getting some ideas to come up with the best decisions? Okay. So you might think, I don't do projects. I do work. And I, you know, I have things to do, and they're not really projects. But if you think about it, most of what your organisation does is actually project-based. If you have a high-powered individual or team coming here, guess who has to take care of them? You do. If something has to be created around a report or some detailed information, who does that? You do, and often you do it as groups, and sometimes you do it and it's into departmental groups too, depending on the size. And we don't possibly think about that work as project management in the years. So when we think about our work, the upside is you do your project well, no one says anything. You probably don't get any praise, you probably don't get any recognition, you probably don't get a bonus, but you definitely don't get a bonus. Uh, you might get a beer if you're liking the market up, but it'll be about it. But, if anything goes wrong, then it's serious trouble. So if you think about it, your lives are a collection of work projects, which are high risk because of the nature of the people you have to deal with, and low reward in reality, right? If you think about that, that's not a great combination. If you work in the finance business like I used to, it's high risk, but it's also high reward. You know, it's got a, a balance, but in your case, you have really high level projects with not just the individuals who come, but their entourage, right? And often the media. And so this can be very high profile projects, which if you get them wrong, it's seriously bad for everybody. So we might not think of our work as projects, but in fact they are. And often you are cooperating together, not just your own department, but with other departments coordinating. And often back in home base back in Australia, or it could even be with other countries, depending on the nature of the project. So there's a lot of coordination involved, but we don't actually give anyone any great insight into how to do that. And this day to day, I hope, will give you a structure of how to think about that, and how to execute, and how to work together in teams across departments, within your own department, so you never have one of those incidents come up that's going to be a career ender or a career damager. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be a great outcome. All right, so let's have a look. We're going to do a lot today uh, from the manual, but just to look at the program objectives, we're going to get a planning process to line up with the projects you have. We're going to do some uh, SWOT on the planning, maybe project planning first up, and then get some sense of who's going to be accountable or responsible for what, right? So what's the uh, overview of the planning, and then get into some of the detail. The second part of the day where we do project management, we're going to take many of the elements from the project planning component and go very deep, very, very deep in detail with that. It's incredibly detailed. So you'll never have to say, oh, I didn't get enough information about what I need to do. You'll have truckloads, tons of information. So that won't be an issue for you. So let's, uh, let's get into it then. Let's start with, um, in, your, in your teams, let's just think about, you know, what's, uh, 
get some focus around the subject. You know. Why do you think people don't do a good enough job of planning? Uh, we all have to plan, but often we don't do it very well. So at the tables, just have a quick discussion. Why do you think we have trouble with planning things? What things get in the way? What things prevent us from planning as well as we should? What's holding us back? What are some of the issues around planning? So just at your table, let's have a quick discussion about that, and then we'll get some feedback. Okay, let's just pull it up there. I'm sure you've got truckloads of ideas on why people don't do enough planning, but let's get some feedback. Maybe from this table, what were some of the things that came up? Lack of communication. Lack of communication, yep. Too much communication. Uh, too much, that's what I said, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can be the same, actually. Not enough time. Time last, is a problem, yes. Yep. Last minute changes. Yes, changes coming through. Insufficient information. Not enough information, uh, yes. Lack of prioritisation. Uh huh. Lack of prioritization. Clear objectives. Objectives not clear. Lack of staff and resources. No resources. Okay. How about you guys over here? Anything that didn't get picked up in that group? Additional to that? Demotivation. Demotivation, yeah. Demotivation. Lack of motivation. Yes. Budget. Budget's not enough. That's always a problem. Yeah. Resources is an issue, yes. Yeah. How about on the back table here? Anything that wasn't already covered there? Um, I think experience. No one's ah. ever done it before. So yes, first time to do it, not enough experience. Or the experience was here, but that experience has now moved to another country. Right? And they're no longer available. Yeah, that can happen too. And a lot of decisions being beyond your control, like you have no control. Yes, you're, yes, you've got no authority, but you've got a lot of responsibility. That's also <laughs> very tricky. External drivers. Yes, external drivers, that's right. Someone who knows nothing about the country here, knows nothing about the situation here, trying to make you do things, which is hard to fit into the plan, right? So there are a lot of issues around planning, and we know this, don't we? But let's plan something. Let's start with something. We're going to have a pizza party tomorrow night to celebrate the end of today's training. The budget for each person is 2,000 yen. Okay, go ahead, plan the party. Okay, you're probably on the way through, but let's just see how far you've got. On this table over here, how did you decide to start? Who took the leadership? Who took some leadership? Was there a leader on this table? Did someone lead the discussion? Not really. Not really? So no, no designated leader? Okay, right. How about on this table? Is there a designated leader? Sorry? <laughs> Humbly he says it was me, but that's okay. How about over here? Did you have a designated leader? We didn't designate a leader. No designated leader, okay? Fine. So, in this case, how did well, Tom is not sure he was the leader. Ben thinks he was. He was a driver. He was a driver, right? So how did that happen? How did that work? He initiated the conversation. He initiated, right? He took ownership and he stepped up and he said, I'm going to lead this discussion. Okay? And what were some of the challenges you found having to do this plan? This is a project, it's going to be a pizza party, we know it's on tomorrow night. The resources, 2,000 up ahead, we know who's going to be there. What, what were some of the challenges you found in doing that? We tried to find out more information recently in this. Uh... Yeah, you didn't have much information, did you? It was very vague, and you needed to fill in a lot of gaps. So, what was missing in the information? What did you find challenging, Tiani? Yeah. In terms of the planning, the idea is No frame, yeah. So you're having a, a, a discussion that's overlapping a little bit, no particular direction, we, we no structure. A, we could have used a project manager and an agenda maker to start with, but, but we were getting to that. We were brainstorming. Yeah. You're still brainstorming, yeah. You're in the brainstorming stage. Yeah, that's right. How about over here? What were some challenges you had? Uh, not challenges, but it's just, it's just a pizza party, but all these little, little things that we have to do, like yeah. all these tasks, mm -hmm. sort of show that it was sort of, you know, planning and mm -hmm. arranging it. Yeah, there's a lot of detail, isn't there? A lot of detail in that once you start digging into it. So, when we think about projects, you know, there are many options. You covered some, look at the next page on page, uh, what are you, page two. 
you actually nominated some of these already, I think. Uh, and if you think about some of these, this list, you know, number one, you no know, specific tools or planning process in place. Now, if there was a handy tool you could go to, you'd probably start with that, but often that doesn't exist. Or goals are a bit vague, or the scope creep. That means it was supposed to be this bigger project, but it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger as more people think, why don't we do this as well? And suddenly it's massive, right? Or uh, it's very unclear about timetable, budget, who's going to do what, none of that's been worked out, we follow up, how will that work? Uh, senior management not supportive, right? they're not giving any direction. Work styles are different, some people are very big picture, strategy, other people are very micro focused, very detail oriented, some people are very confident, speak up, take over, other people are very considered, quiet, don't say much, so their ideas don't really get caught up in the idea exchange, they just get put to the side. Okay. Someone, you talk about motivation over here, right? Like demotivation, lack of motivation, enthusiasm, commitment. Often teams can start enthusiastic and then the enthusiasm just drops <laughs> as the difficulties rise, right? Or over time it starts to wane. And then you've got uh, your team, there might be other teams you need to coordinate with, integrate with. Okay, everyone's busy, they've got other projects they're working on as well, they've got demands coming in suddenly, take them out of the picture. They've got lack of trust and communication, yeah, that can happen, that can happen. You know, often it happens in big organisations that the silos uh, of organisations, the heads, don't like each other. There's rivalry or some bad blood there, bad feeling. And so the whole teams have trouble working together because the top don't like each other. You know, so trust is out the window. And communication becomes poor because there's not a lot of incentive to cooperate on a project because it's coming from the very top. And inability to delegate and hold accountable. So who's going to do what? Uh, we say, you know, classically, three people do everything in the team and everyone else sits back and watches. It's not a great way to do it. So how do we get everyone involved and make sure that they take a role? And then, you know, diverse work styles, how do we coach, how do we resolve conflicts? Conflict resolution in teams can be very difficult sometimes. People have strong views on how it should be done or the way of doing it, whatever, and they, they want to argue about it. Were there any other things that we didn't cover in your own tables before which make it hard for us to run projects, apart from this list? Anything else? We didn't, you covered a number on your tables before when I asked you about why project planning is tricky. Anything additional to this list that you can come up with, maybe specific for your work? Pretty much cover it? Pretty good? So, one of the things too, uh, when we talk about project management, often people think of, oh, it's all done by tools. You know, there's a toolbox, a Gantt chart. Does anyone know what a Gantt chart is? It's a very common planning tool, very simple. Just on a, a horizontal, you'll have time going this way and elements of the project going this way. And certain things get done before others and they're running simultaneously. So you can actually chart what has to happen. This part of the project has to happen in the first month. In week nine, this has to happen. In week 15 or something, this has to happen. So you can actually visually see the milestones or the achievement points of the project all lined up through the project. All right? And maybe somebody's name attached to that as well. That's called a Gantt chart, quite handy. Or there's things like critical path analysis, where you identify that the critical task, this must happen in order that this will happen in order that this result will be achieved. So you have to work out the path of, of, uh, of, of uh, connection there. Or things called PERT charts, which is a program review evaluation technique, which is sort of checking, checking the, how things are going on the way through, like a plan do see type of thing. It's that, it's that type of uh, charts. Lots of you know, things like base camp, and there's no shortage of tools around project management. Now, here's the sad news. Tools are not enough, because people have to use the tools. You have to rely on people to use the tools. 
And if you can't rely on the people, it doesn't matter how brilliant the tool is, the, you know, it won't work. So going on to base camp or something else, what am I, they're all fantastic, there's nothing wrong with these things. The problem is people have to do their role and you have to work out what the role will be and make some decisions and this is where project planning really uh, is a science actually. Yeah, but it's a science of human cooperation. Right? That's what it's really about. So uh, if we think about it here on page or page three, you see this chart here. This is the anatomy of a project. And we're going to go into great depth on the elements of this in the second module we're going to do today. But you see how we break a project down. You see some percentages of time there. So you're defining the scope. And it's got should be and as is. That's 20%. So the should be is, well, what would we like to see happen? In an ideal world, what would a great outcome look like? That's a should be. The as is is our current reality. Right? Our current reality. Our current reality might be we don't have enough people. Our current reality might be we don't have enough time. We don't have enough uh, budget. That might be our reality, but we might have this big project we've got to do. And ideally, we'd like to do it this way, but we can actually can we do it. That's the scope. So what are we going to do? And importantly, what are we not going to do? Because I talked about scope creep before. Gradually expands. It's a danger. And then actually devising the plan. So what are our goals we want to set? What are the action steps we need to take to achieve those goals? What's this going to cost and how long will it take? So there are some key elements in the planning. That is 50% of the plan. So already, between just defining the scope and the steps, we're already at 70% of the time. Then we start the implementation as we roll out the action steps, with designated people and with budgets attached to it. And then we check, okay, is this on track? Or oh, we need to adapt. Or oh, we don't have someone to do that, we're going to have to make a change there we don't have enough money and we review as we go and we have some points along the path to check we're on schedule or make some changes if we need it. So that's 15%. And then get to closure. So make sure we complete it, uh, evaluate it, we follow up, measure it, and then celebrate it. Now, one of the critical things for an organisation like yours is you tend to do very similar things often. There's a lot of commonalities to what you do. So in your reviews, at some point in time, you'll be capturing every project, very valuable insight and lessons. But the question there is, does the system, does the structure allow you to really capture the learnings? Or the project group comes together, the project's completed, the project group disbands, and the knowledge is lost. Then there's another project and you can do the whole thing again. Because there's no structure and there's no learning. You see? See, these notes I'm using here are the product of three times on this project that I've done. The learning is going in here. As things happen, I, I make a note. So I don't lose the learning each time I do the same thing. And you think about the number of times your project's always different, but there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of learning there. So how do we capture that? So uh, we know that, you know, we don't plan to fail, but we fail to plan. We know that. So on the next page, we're going to go deeper now. We look into uh, those highlights. So there should be, now, who determines and how accurately do we understand the should be? A lot of your projects are probably initiated outside of this location. They probably started somewhere else but you have to actually deliver the project. So what's the degree of understanding of what your client, if I can use the word client, wants? You have a client and you have to deliver a project for that client who's not necessarily based here. And they probably have very little understanding of what here means and how here works. So what's your own degree of understanding of what they want? Because they'll have an image of what success looks like. And the closer you can get to that image, the more successful you will be with your client in terms of satisfying what they want. So how well do you know the should be for them? 
There'll be a should be for you, but you're ultimately answering to the client. What's a should be for them? So then the A says, this you will know. You will know the current reality. Now here's the problem. The client doesn't understand your as is. They have probably got very little knowledge of your reality. So often their requirements will be completely ridiculous, unrealistic, annoying, upsetting, dangerous, damaging. There'll be a whole bunch of things going on because they don't understand your reality. So in this managing of the client for the project, we have to explain to them our reality, how Japan works. Because they have no clue how Japan works usually, because they're not usually here. Right? So then the goals. The goals comes back to that, you know, ultimate what success looks like. And you see the very classic acronym here, S-M-A-R-T, for organizing goals. It's a very old idea, but it still works, you know. So goals should be very specific in terms of your process and resources. So you're very specific about that. Clear. Data, objective data you can measure. Timelines, it's either done or it's not done by this date. It was done to this degree or not done to this degree by this time. It was done to this standard or not at that point. And A, attainable. So can be achieved. Now this can often be a case that the goal is being set by someone outside of this country are not attainable. It may be meeting a high level VIP in this country whose schedules change very quickly and who may suddenly not become available or would be very difficult to get at that particular point in time that they want to come here, for example. So some of the goals may be very difficult to attain. Relevant to our vision, so the client has a vision of what success looks like and then you have a vision for what you're running the project would look like and therefore the goals must line up. Are your goals relevant to achieving that vision? And then, of course, time specific with a deadline. So a goal that has no end deadline never gets done, just never gets achieved because we've got too many competing other goals with deadlines that uh, we will focus our attention on. So when we're seeing the goals, we've got our goals here, but we've also got the goals of the client to think about. Then action steps. So yes, uh, what's required, break it down. Who should do which steps? Who's got the right skills? What methodologies should we use? Uh, how, do we, how do we coordinate, integrate the whole thing into a sequence so that it works as the project gets done? Then how do we keep up to date with what's going on? How do we do a final report? Now, in some cases, there may not be, uh, well, there might be probably be a cable, or there might be some reporting at the end about what happened. But what we're talking about here is maybe the report might be internal in terms of the review of what actually took place and how it worked out and the lessons we learned from that. Then on the next page you see cost, right, which is, again, there's a budget of time, because it's not just money, is it? In a busy organisation, time is a very, very valuable item. So it's not just money. Yes, money is one part of it, but also time. And then uh, materials, of course, etc. Then the timetables, this is where your Gantt chart I talked about before is very good for seeing what needs to happen in sequence, and by when, and uh, what needs to happen before this can happen and start. And then implementation. Now the implementation sounds straightforward, except it's rare that you have only one project. That would be ideal, right? I just have this one project to work on, but that's not how life works. Right? You've always got other things you're working on simultaneously, multiple projects, multiple demands, People in the organisation suddenly determining they need you to do something else. Suddenly, you know, it wasn't planned. So the implementation, suddenly what looked like a, a good time plan can get very squeezed because your time gets, gets broken up. And then follow up, measurement, these are things we need to look at in detail to know whether we were successful. Now, not just for the client, the client will get, uh, you know, as I said before, the car turned up. The car didn't turn up. That's an objective measure of success for that project, right? Very simple thing. So that's their measure. Things that should have happened, happen, and they happen the way they should have happened. That's how they will measure it. And if it goes hummingly, smoothly, 
you'll never hear anything back, but if there's any problem, you'll certainly hear about that as usual. So, on the next page, on 6 and 7, 6 and 7, we have a sheet here, and then on 8, we're going to work out who's going to do what. So if you look at the next three pages, we're going to take a project. Now, what I'd like you to do is individually, individually, please choose a real project, preferably something that you're working on now or something that you will need to work on that's coming, if you can do that. If you have something that's on the table now, use that, as I said before. Our case studies in Dale Carnegie are your reality. What's the reality of your current work? Is there a project you're working on? Might be putting together a report, might be planning for a visit, it could be any number of things. If you don't have something particularly that you're working on now, go back to a previous project, okay? And replan that project. Go through the process. Because what we're practicing here is trying to use that anatomy of the project scope right the way through to see how it looks. Now we'll go into uh, more detail when we do the project management later today. This is a first, first cut, just looking at the idea, and, but putting it into a reality for yourself. So either a project you're working on now, a project you will be working on very shortly, if you don't have either of those, which I'd say would be pretty unlikely, uh, something you've just worked on recently. Who has the first question? We're going to work on this individually because it's your reality. This is you, okay? And start planning that. Oh, no questions, we good? So pick a project and let's go through. Give the project a name, what it should be, as is, what are the goals, action steps, cross timetable, measures, stop there, and then we'll come after that and then look at who's going to do what for the project on page eight. Right, we'll get to that. But let's get the first section done and we'll look at that. Everyone good? Okay. Individual work way. Okay, I think we've pretty much done the first part. So let's break it up a little bit. Maybe pair, pair, triad down here. Maybe pair, triad here. Just share with each other, going through this exercise, which elements did you find the most valuable and which did you find the most challenging? Okay, which are the most valuable elements of doing this exercise and the most challenging? and share that with each other. Right, you're all doing different projects probably, so it's not about the project, it's about the process. Everyone clear what you're going to do? Everyone good? In those groups, share. Most valuable, most challenging. Have a discussion. Okay, let's pull it up there and let's get some feedback. Let's start with, on this maybe pair over here, what was valuable? Yeah, so there's a structure. Yeah, structure. You don't have to think. Mm -hmm. You we can just sort of go, well, yeah. do this, do this, do yeah. this, and so it's there. ideas, but at this moment, we didn't have a um, structure no. of like, uh, time, timeline, how we should, should do effectively it. do this. Also. So think about that. How long has this organization been operating, do you think? How long has it been operating here, and yet, for what is a very common activity, there's no go-to structure that everyone would know, and everyone would use. I find that very interesting. I think you're friendly. How about the triad? So over here, anything came up over here that was valuable? Um, I found it valuable because um, I was worrying about a project that I'm working on. Good. Um, it's not finished yet, but when I got to like, the follow-up measures, it made me realize of things that I can already improve next year and have to do it again. So yes. It gave me so the follow-up component gave you some hints on things you hadn't anticipated. Yeah, how about the triad down the back here? What did you find useful? Yeah, I found that the campaign would achieve again this the structure was good. We tended to concentrate more on the what was, what was problematic. Right, well, actually, okay, then, then we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. Because I want to hear about the challenges, but was there anything particularly valuable you found in that? Um, yeah, I, I, again, it was uh, similar to uh, my son called, I was found to be setting it all out like that. Clarified in my own head uh, exactly what, what uh, was yeah. how the different steps were. That's right. 
gives us a bit of a roadmap to start with in their planning. Because once you've got that structure, you just got to fill in the blanks, basically. And it's, it works, it's got sequence, and then it makes life easier. How about challenges? We'll come to your challenges in a moment. Any challenges you found? Whenever I was doing my projects, I always had a vague idea of what I need to do and everything. Right. But so the goals were never really crystal clear enough right. in the planning. Right. But yeah. now that I needed to write them down, yes. I found it kind of hard. Yeah, that's right. And often we have that. Our, our minds are vaguely thinking about a goal, but when you actually have to describe it, there's a certain clarity and precision that goes with that, which makes it quite a bit harder. How about you guys? What did you find was challenging? Mm -hmm. um, I said, but, um, we found it valuable to think about the um, objectives, yeah. but at the same time, the things that we think uh, the objectives might help be more, for example, cameras expect. Ah, so your objectives and the client's objectives might be different. Yeah, that could be a problem, right? <laughs> That's probably a common problem, I would think, <laughs> often comes up. So this is where we are satisfying ourselves but we're not satisfying the actual originating client, and that's where we get into trouble, right? Yeah. How about you? You talked about yeah, Max about challenges. What were some of the challenges? One of them was that the different expectations of the client and the reality of the situation here in specific cases where they had So the, the challenges there are often originated from outside, in which we have no control. There is a time pressure because it's a resource, as I said before, one of the most key resources is your time. And then you've got personnel changes. You know, in your case, the timing doesn't suit because it was, you arrange your one set of timing for one circumstance and they change the circumstance, it upsets the whole calendar. There's probably a chain reaction all the way through the system. And now a new person who's not being part of the entire uh, gestation period of this project is suddenly tagged with uh, taking it over. And it come up over here on the challenges side. Oh, look, I mean, I guess, I guess it might, what I got out of it, two, two things, it's like an ideas generator. So I could, it's like a canvas and I could see how can I fill this up so it kind of like gets the imagination going. And then the second thing is like I could see a, a more kind of bird's eye view of this project in my life at that time so I could see that I had to, these other commitments and other goals not related to this project but I had to fit the project in yes. with all the other stuff that that's going, that on was going on so I had to stop it getting too big. Yes yeah. and that's, that's important as a project so scope is a, uh, it's like the bright shiny object oh wouldn't be good if we did this as well but once you decide to do that, you start adding things on. Something else has to get delayed yeah. or removed because yeah. you have a finite amount of time. Yeah. So we've got to be very careful about project scope. Any other things that came up which were valuable or challenging, which we haven't covered yet? Yeah. So that communication issue within the team, particularly when you've got changes of personnel, someone's taking time off or be called off to another project, that often happens. And someone grabs your people and they want to work on a what they consider a higher priority project and suddenly you're short of team members and the communication piece disappears and then you've got people who are outside the country, outside your operation, who need to know things or worse, they know things but they forget to tell you until the last moment, right? Which just completely blows your schedule apart and that happens all the time, doesn't it? Right. On the next page, you can see there on 1.8, who should do what now? This is nominating either an individual you work with, it might be within your own team, it might be an individual who works in another team, or it might be an entire department. So when we look on this one here, this is starting to work out who's going to do what, what am I responsible for, and what are they responsible for. So you think about your project, either the one that's coming up, the one you're working on now, or the one that's just passed, and you say, well, you know, uh, I had to work with Tom, and now, what am I responsible for to Tom? I need to brief Tom on this, 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 and this. 
what does Tom need to do for me? He needs to have his part of the project completed by this day, or whatever it might be. So you start looking at the actual individuals you're working with and then uh, nominating what you need to do and also what they need to do for you. So this becomes very clear. So just take a moment, you don't have to do too many of these, just pick a couple of people and start thinking about what you need to do for them, what they need to do for you, and part of this might be that communication issue. When this is clearer and everyone understands who's doing what, communication improves. It's where we don't know what we're responsible for, or we're not really clear what we're responsible for, we get communication issues, and then things get dropped, things get missed, and mistakes happen, and then trouble comes in, in short order. Any questions on this part? Any questions? Okay, take a few moments, just pick a couple of people and start going through that process and nominate what you're going to do, what they need to do, and who is it. As I say, it might be an individual, it might be a team, it might be a department, it might be your own department, it might be your own team, or it might be someone you work with. Okay, we'll just have a uh, look there so far. Is this something you would normally do when you're putting projects together? It's not, is it? We don't actually normally sit down in this business and really think about, well, here are the people I need to interact with, here's what I need to do for them, and here's what they need to do for me. And those people could actually be located outside this country. It could be someone sitting in a department or a team somewhere else in another country, and actually you have to give things to them in terms of feedback or scheduling or information, and actually they need to give you stuff. It would be very nice at the start of your planning to actually nominate who had to do what. We haven't, what we're saying here is, we haven't designated what we want to happen at the beginning. Yes, of course the people in the other teams know they're responsible for something, or well, you hope they're responsible, but we maybe didn't make it very clear exactly what we wanted them to do. And maybe we didn't tell them exactly what we would do for them at the very start. Now, things change. You know, Max mentioned before, he's responsible for a certain number of things to a group of people, and because of a scheduling change, he can no longer fulfill that role. Someone else has to step in and do that. So that will be a change. But still, things have to happen on that project for other groups. They need to do things for us, we need to do things for them. So at the beginning, you can plan this, be, of course, prepared that the plan will change. But at least if you've got a starting point, you can bounce off the changes against the starting point, then they're micro changes. They're micro changes. Nothing, only a couple of people change their detail, but everything else basically stays the same. Anything else that came up about this exercise? Anything else that occurred to you? Put that into your mix when you're doing your project planning. You've got your project stages, and then responsibility designation. Taking the project that you've been working on before, you designated either a current project, a future project, or a past project, then we're going to apply a SWOT analysis. Now, SWOT is a very, very old tool. Right, this goes right back in the 1960s, but just because it's an old uh, tool or a toolkit doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. It's very simple. So now you're analyzing your team. Okay? Uh, it could be uh, an individual in the team, or it could be the whole team. And you're starting to anticipate trouble. And you're looking also at when you start aligning tasks with people who should get which tasks. Now often, people are given tasks for which they are highly unsuitable. And that's because they're available. You know, you suddenly find you've only got three people, but none of them are particularly good in this particular area. But that's the three people. <laughs> but if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't ask one of them to do this particular task because they're not skilled in that area. But anyway, it's good to know what you require of people. So what are their strengths? Look at the, again, it could be a team, or it could be an individual in this project that you've been working on, or your own team. 
Uh, what are the strengths of your team or the strengths of individuals in your team? What are the weaknesses of the individual or the team which you need to be prepared for? And then what are some threats or, uh, and opportunities to that team, opportunities and threats? This is again, opportunities would be things that would be innovative or you could capitalise on past experience. There might be somebody sitting in another city somewhere who did this exact same project last year and had been moved. Wouldn't it be fantastic to pick up the phone and say, by the way, I'm going to do exactly what you did last year. And I'd really like to ask you for some advice on the things I should be careful of. And some, on reflection, if you had to do this again, what, have, what would it be that you would do differently this time around? Wouldn't that be useful? So there are sorts of opportunities. Or there might be uh, some reports on this particular project that you can go back and consult. Or there might be an opportunity to brainstorm about how we could do it better or how we could be more innovative or more efficient or more productive or whatever. And then the threats, of course, you know, this might be schedules change, it might be um, egos of very powerful people, uh, it could be the entourage, it could be the media coming with them, it could be any number of things going on. There might be something happening on the counterparty side where you're working with the other organisation here and uh, things that are changing there. There could be shift of personnel, there could be uh, any number of political things could be happening in the background which could impact on what you're doing. What we're saying here is at the planning stage of your project, you don't bump into those things on the way through. You think about them early. You plan for these things at the start so that when they come up, you're not caught short or surprised or unprepared. You've actually thought about this possibility already. Everyone clear on the swap? Either for an individual or a team related to the project you've been working on. All good? Okay, let's go. Let's do this one. Okay, let's get some feedback on the project you're working on and either individuals or, or the team itself or however you've done it. What were some of the strengths that you recognised for people involved in that project? Say, uh, what was something you saw that's a plus? So, where, where I worked, we had a good working relationship within the team. We've got a good working relationship inside the team. So, we were able to bounce off ideas and okay. what else. So, there's a fair bit of trust in that team to share ideas, put the ideas up, and then look for a, a better solution. Yeah. What else? What else are some of the strengths? We have some very experienced staff members. Yeah, you have a, you've been doing this a long time. You have very experienced staff members who've been doing it a long time as well. Yeah, that's right. It's not the first time, but there's very few things you'd be doing which you've never done before in some fashion, I would guess. It's always a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarities. What else are some strengths? What are some strengths? Networks? Okay, this would be networks in the local, business community, government, etc. here, and also networks back home as well, because they're important too, aren't they? Yeah. What else is some strength? Maybe it's similar to what Ben said, um, when coordination yes. goes well. Yes. Yeah, so there's good, good communication, coordination works well, yeah. trust is there, the relationships are there, people are cooperative, they're, they feel motivated, they feel they want to be part of the project. Yes. Yeah. Very good. So, then let's flip it around. What are some of the, the, the weaknesses or some of the areas that we could probably improve or things we need to take into consideration that could become an issue for us? What are some of the weaknesses? What about yeah, communication with people sitting outside Japan who may not understand anything about Japan and how things work here. That could be a, an issue. What else? Lack of knowledge and experience. Yeah. Because diplomats come and go every three years. That's right. There's turnover of personnel. So the expertise gets on a plane and goes to another country and takes a, their knowledge, experience, wisdom with them. And then someone new turns up and they may not have been in Japan before. 
they may not have worked on this particular type of uh, project before, and we start again. So this is where capturing knowledge for you guys is really a critical part of uh, making your life easier. So that handover from one leader to another can become very, very smooth. You have some curious rules in your organization about uh, handover. You basically don't have any handover in your organization, which makes it a bit hard. Most organizations, at least you have an overlap, you can actually share a lot. In a lot of cases, in an organization, you don't, so it's hard. What else? What are some other weaknesses? Lack of resources. Pardon? Lack of resources. Lack of resources, which would be like what? Time. Time? Budget. Budget, yeah. 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 Experience of staff, you know, that you need. Often the key people are sought by a number of projects, right? Really valuable staff are sought out by other groups working on their projects and they try and grab them for their project and they're not available for yours. That could be a bit of a problem. What else? So you've got you've got ongoing annual projects that come up continuously. So there's some expectations around what's achievable, what's not achievable. Yeah. Yeah. And often uh, it happens a lot in, in industry. Uh, someone new comes in and everything that went before is rubbish and all their ideas are genius. So they start again, you know, and that happens a lot. It happens a lot. And they think that whatever you've been doing isn't good enough and their way is better. And then suddenly people aren't very happy about that. And then the coordination falls off, the motivation falls off, uh, and then you have communication issues, it triggers a whole chain reaction. Of <laughs> things are basically bad. And opportunities, this is this one. What are some things uh, for your teams where you can actually go beyond what's already been done before or, or come up with something new or some more innovative ideas? What are some opportunities? Uh, just a generic one that um, technology technology. Yes? Well, that's an interesting point about technology. You know, later today, I'm going to ask you, when you come back in the afternoon, if you haven't already got them on you, bring your mobile phone, or bring your iPad, or whatever, because we have a server. There's a website, or you just use the QR code. You go to that website, and you fill out a survey of the training for today. We used to do this by paper. We'd hand out surveys by paper, you'd fill them out, we'd collect them, we'd send them to New York, they'd process them, they'd send it back to us, and then we'd give it to your organisation, this is what happened in the training. But here's technology, we don't, there's no paper, except for this piece of paper I'm going to give you. And it's instant, the minute you fill this out, that can be processed real time as a record. So that's an efficiency. Now I seem to recall uh, these wonderful little books when we had visits, you know, yep. and it was uh, very hard to update those because guess what? You have a book published, and then things have changed, and you have to reprint parts of it. And to, today we've got maybe technology uh, where we can maybe go beyond that. So that could be a, a big opportunity to bring in new technology that is secure but also able to be shared and able to operate in real time, which we've never had before. So what are some other opportunities? That's a good one. What are some others? I find Japanese government and ministries quite efficient. Okay. To so your counterparts are very organized and efficient yeah. compared to? Other countries. Other countries. It's like chaotic in some <laughs> developing countries. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. Japan is a very efficient, uh, disciplined, uh, has a very loyal workforce compared to some countries. Yeah. We operate in nearly 100 countries around the world, so I interact with my colleagues in different countries, and the response times are very innocent. Very innocent. Sometimes, you know, it's a different idea of time. But Japan, I think, is very prompt. That's a big help. What are some other opportunities? Yeah. So we, we have the opportunity when we're looking at our projects to think about partners or counterparts and think about some new counterparts. You know, like there are lots of industries here, uh, even the, the Shin Keidan Ren, but that didn't exist. That did not exist. And you know, there's a whole uh, peak organization 
of different types of companies to the keynote. You know, so that's something, again, as an outreach, that uh, you can go to, which you didn't have before. And then you've got uh, a whole startup community of small innovative enterprises, which probably didn't exist 10 years ago. And now there are organizations, sort of peak organizations, industry organizations, for those groups. I went to a presentation recently, and I came across a thing called Impact Hub. Have you ever heard of Impact Hub? Well, that's full of people trying to do startups who get together in a common space and share ideas and work together. And it's actually, it's in a number of countries around the world. I've never even heard of it. And there were two people gave this present. I realized, oh, there's a thing called Impact Hub. If I contact them, I can find innovative individuals looking to start companies or to start businesses. If I was interested in that particular group. Now, as part of your, your project scope, you might be finding organizations like Shinkeiro or uh, Impact Hub or something that wasn't there before, and that adds a different texture. Now, you've got a particular leader who's talking about a lot about innovation. You've got a particular leader who talks a lot about the challenges, but also the opportunities for the future. So those sorts of innovative, creative, uh, counterpart organisations are going to be very interesting, uh, maybe compared to the more traditional businesses. So yeah, that's great. How about um, threats? So we're probably a bit of overlap, perhaps, here with weakness. But what are some of the threats to your team? That's right. So on the Japanese side, you've got imperatives that drive their timetable, which are not so easy to control. Now, are our representatives understanding about that? Uh, yeah, it varies. varies, right? Some are not very understanding at all. Some are very self-important. Big egos, what do you mean? I'm here, they should be here. You're supposed to be doing it. So you put yourself in a very difficult position. And uh, my experience with Japanese organizations is they will never burn anybody for you. <laughs> they, won't, they won't burn any relationships or, or make any problems for themselves in the future for a short-term gain for your project. They always have a long-term perspective. But often the people we're dealing with have got a very short-term perspective, which is what they want now. Uh, that can be a very big struggle you know, of uh, doing that. So you're pushing them to change or do something, and they're saying, well, no, I'm not going to do that, because now I have to go and push a whole bunch of other people, and I'm going to compromise my relationships for what? Uh, no great value to me not going to do it, right? So that's a threat. Trying to get people to cooperate when there are imperatives on their side, it can be very difficult. In your business, it's quite tricky. What are some other threats? Sorry? Risk aversion. Risk aversion, right? Did anybody in Japan ever get promoted for taking a risk? Not many people. No, there are some, I'm sure, but the vast majority see failure, and the consequences of failure are severe in Japan, and so they, they make a balanced decision. It's a very logical decision. The upside is tremendously tiny because you get promoted on seniority when you join the, the organization or how old you are. And even if you come up with some brilliant idea, it doesn't mean anything. No bonuses, no uh, commissions, uh, no promotion. So upside is tiny and the downside is big. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to vote for a safety. And it, it, that's a good point, you know, there's a lack of worldliness and also we went through that exercise of individual responsibility for who's going to be accountable and accountable to who. In a bureaucracy, uh, like the one here, um, okay, it didn't happen. There's no punishment particularly because it didn't happen, it wasn't a mistake, uh, they missed the boat, the opportunity was taken away, but there's no immediate downside no immediate downside. and there's no particular responsibility attached to any individual so the whole organization suffers the opportunity loss but no one actually directly gets punished so they just sort of keep shuffling along yeah. okay the next section we're going to cover is this is page 1.11 uh, of the manual this on the plan to delegate and then empower part of getting to successful implementation. And the planning part we've just covered, but inside that planning component is we need to have others take responsibility for parts of the project. 
So there's a delegation component. Now the team leader, usually there'd be a team leader, has to delegate some parts of the task to other people. But generally speaking, delegation is always an issue. It's an issue in companies, it's an issue in just about every organisation. So, what is the difficulty with delegation? Why is it hard to get people to delegate? What's stopping us from delegating? What do you think? Fear. Fear. What do we fear when we give delegation? Yeah, we feel I have entrusted you for this role, but if you don't deliver it, it could be a career ending outcome for me, as I just explained earlier. That was exactly the case. Someone had been delegated to do something, they had not done it correctly, but the buck stopped with the leader, who then, in that particular case, they lost their job, ended their career. You know, that's a big deal. What are some other things about delegation? Why we don't do it? It takes time to sometimes delegate something. Means we've got to explain it, doesn't it? It's time consuming. That's the classic sentence, right? It'll be faster if I do this myself. So I'll do it. So we never delegate. And that's exactly the problem. Now that's actually, it's a very common thing. But we will never be able to leverage ourselves and do more if we don't learn how to delegate. And I, there's a whole, we, we have a two hour module just on delegation. But the key points I want to bring out for you today are here. Sell the delegation, then they plan, not you, they plan what they're going to do as a delegatee as a person delegated to when they do the project and then we just monitor what they do. Now, this is the problem. The self part doesn't happen. Now think about, think about your own experience. Think about your own experience when you've been delegated to. Someone has come up to you and said, Mike, I would like you to do this Please. Hopefully they said please. <laughs> now this has been this has been my experience of receiving delegation. Greg, get on to that. Finish that report. That's it. And that's very common. People we call that dumping. They call that dumping. They dump the work on your desk. And they come into the office, they look around. Who doesn't look busy? <laughs> Here's the taking the talent and time resource match, right? Not who's the best person for this task, who's not busy? Oh, Tom, you're not looking so busy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give this to Tom, you know? What we should be doing, obviously, is we should be lining up in our team, our project team, who's got the skills and experience or the capability or the adaptability or the capacity to learn who could take this portion of the project. So we match talent or capability or capacity with the actual task. That's the first thing. It's not, who's not looking, oh, she's not looking busy, bingo. The second thing is we turn up and we say, do this for me, or I want you to do this. So as a receiver, what do we hear? We hear, oh, I'm already busy, thank you very much, and now I have to do your work as well. So whose project is this? It's not my project, I'm doing your project, and I'm busy. So I resent you for giving me this work. I'm demotivated because you don't appreciate how busy I am. You didn't even inquire all the other projects I'm working on. So demotivating people. Now, if I said to you something like, if I sold the delegation to you, and I said, it's he Tom, is it? He Tom. I said to he Tom. He told me, 
I'm really looking forward to you stepping up in the organisation. It's very hard in our organisation to get selected to be promoted because they're always looking for experience and it's one of those things, it's hard to have that experience when you're in this current role. Now, I am going to give you a piece of a project for you to get that experience so that when you're in the interview for that position, you can reference, well, I have done this particular piece of work, I have this experience, and that will help you to build your career. And I'm going to help you with this project, but I'm going to give you a piece of it. You can own it, so you can say, I did this, and that will help you to build your career. Do you hear the difference? My, boom, get to it. As opposed to this delegation, this task, this project is helping you build your career, helping you build your base of experience, making you more attractive as a delegate or a candidate for a higher position of responsibility by giving you a part of that responsibility task earlier before you arrive there. You're going to feel a bit more motivated to do the task, aren't you? You say, well, there's something in it for me. People often delegate, oh, this is what I need. Ah, oh, you know, Ben, I'm, man, I'm busy. Oh, I'm so busy, you can't believe it. I've got emails, I've got projects, I've got timelines, I've got, I want you to do this. And as if you've got nothing to do, right? As if I'm the only one who gets emails. As if I'm the only one who's got a lot of things on. Well, your motivation is like zero, right? I, and you do it because you have no choice, but you don't do it with your heart and your soul and your passion. Right? The other thing is, I shouldn't tell you how to do it. I can do that, of course. Often, uh, if I'm the leader, I may have more experience or I may have uh, done this before somewhere else or seen it, and I can tell you, well, now you do A, B, C, D, E. But I can do that. If I do that, I still own the delegation. What would be better if I said, Ben, here's what we've got to do. What do you think about how we could do this? Or, you know, uh, it goes up. What are your ideas? Any, any innovations you think we could bring to this? Now, suddenly, it's no longer me owning the delegation. You've now bought it because you're inputting your ideas. You're owning the task. So what's your commitment like? <laughs> what's your motivation like? <laughs> Hi. Right. Now, what's my job? My job is to monitor. Now, here's the tricky part. If you're ever leading a project, you might think common sense is common. No. <laughs> no. Now, we have men and women in this room, and we have different nationalities in this room, and different backgrounds in this room. Let me assure you, in my experience, common sense is definitely not common. So you might be thinking, well, we're here at A, and logically, we would go to B as the next step. So I've given you the delegation task. Uh, you've told me what you're going to do, and I go, great, go and do it. Thinking you're going to go A, B. But you don't. You go A, C. And then if I don't check, at the end, the word comes back and you go, oh my God, it's not B, it's C. It should be B. Why is it C? And there's no time to fix it or it's a panic or it's a nightmare. Now, if you micromanage it, they don't feel the ownership. You know, it's like planting the, the seed and then digging it up to see how it's going. Has it germinated yet? You know? You've got to let them go, but you can't let them go without being monitored, but not micromanaged. Because you can't presume A to B is the logical step for them. They might think the logical step is A to C based on their experience and their current knowledge. So with delegation, pick the right person, not who's free and not looking busy. Sell what's in it for them. Let them plan and help them with the planning, but let them lead it, and then just check that it's actually going where it should be going. The other one there is empower. How can we do other things to empower people, do you think? You're in a project team, might be a big team or a small team, uh, they've, they've got work, but they've got plenty of work, they've got no shortage. There's no, there's no one sitting around here with nothing to do, right? Everyone's got plenty of work. 
What would make them empowered to do this particular project? What could we do to empower people for projects? What could we do? What do you think? What would be something to do? Praise. Praise, yes. Praise. Now, often if we're doing things for the first time, we're a bit shy, maybe a little bit lacking in confidence about our ability to do something fresh and new. And if we wait for the praise to come at the end, uh, it may be a wasted opportunity. Why not, as people start the project, give them praise on the way through? Because then it helps to build their confidence as they go through the project, as opposed to, it's like Christmas, you know, 25th of December, you get your Christmas present. We can't save it up. Give it to them on the way through. So praise, but often, on the way through, and recognising things are done. And the praise must be real. You know, fake praise doesn't work. Uh, if I say, oh, Kumiko, oh, you're so good, Kumiko. <laughs> oh, Kumiko, you're wonderful. You did such a nice thing. That was great. You're great. Wonderful. <laughs> Kumiko has been a sceptical person, you know. She's worked with Australians for a while, so she's been sceptical. Right? But if I say, Kumiko, the points you brought out in the meeting about how we could innovate, oh, that was fresh. You came up with a couple of really good ideas, particularly that one about saving the time. That was very good. That was great. Thank you. That really made a big contribution. Everyone really benefited from that. That was great. Please keep doing that. So I've, when I praised, I didn't say something vague. I said, in that meeting, you came up with something innovative around time. So she knows it's real. My praise is not just flattery. It's real. Right? What else can we do? What else can we do? About empowering people. Support. Sorry? Support. Support. So, because. Uh, you know, Couples. No, no, support. Ah, support. Yeah. Given the resources to work, yeah. yeah. So, uh, really, when you guys will start to have got the difficulties, then if there's no support available, then you know, they just go around and yeah. just start feeling that uh, there's not my job and then just buy your class guy gets responsibility for something. Yeah. So, uh, maybe that's also important. Yeah, when they don't feel the support, they feel that they've been asked to do something that's now unachievable. Right? You're, it's like that smart goal setting. It must be attainable. You must be you're able to actually do it. And if the resources or the support is not there, you think, well, this is pointless. It's a waste of time. Isn't it? There's no, I can't achieve anything here. It's a waste of my time. I'm not going to do it. So you just withdraw. Right? So if we think about the planning part and the delegation, we get that right. Then empower the people, give them the resources, give them the praise. Uh, we will get them more empowered to actually get to the implementation stage. Now on the next page here, I'm going to stand out. This is some tips around holding people accountable. This is on 1.12, I guess. You know what number 1.12? Correct? Yeah. So here are some tips for holding ourselves and others accountable. So we have our SMART goals. Intermediate, immediate, long range, align with the organization, personal objective. So the goals must fit in holistically with the whole project. Every element of it. It's got to be actually working towards achieving that. Communicate them often and consistently. Now, this is very interesting. When I first became a leader, I thought once I told people something once, they got it and I didn't have to tell it to them again. Imagine my shock when I discovered that is not true. And in fact, as a leader of a project, we will have to tell people often the same things and repeat things more than once so they actually do get it, because people actually don't get it, just from one telling. And it's got to be consistent. So you get buy-in. Now buy-in, we talked about buy-in, what's in it for them. Okay, the, the selling part of the project. Checkpoints, tracking systems, right? And Tommy mentioned about scope creep or mission creep, right? So we make sure that we're on track or if we've got to enlarge the project that it's actually viable and we have the resources to do it or we should try and say, if we can, push back and say no or give us more time or give us more resources. Okay. Prioritisation of activities. and This is something about when you've got so many things going on with a project, there's lots of detail. But there are probably only a few things, a handful of things, 
which really make or break that project. What are they? If you prioritise the key make or break elements of a project and make sure that's on track, everything else will basically come with it. But if you miss one of those and that falls over, it could jeopardise the whole thing. Stay away from superfluous activities that are within our control. So again, we can get uh, tempted to do things which are not actually on target. And when we've got multiple tasks and time short, we shouldn't be doing that. We should really stick, stick to the main thing here. Don't get distracted. So to-do lists, time logs, project lists. You know, here's a question. How many people here at the beginning of the day or the at the end of the previous day write down a to-do list of all the things they need to do and then put a priority of which ones should come first? How many people here do that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Quite a good number. Thank you. That's quite high. Most groups I speak to, none or a couple. Not half like here. Right? This is so effective. If you allocate time, effectively you'll be successful. Well, what's effective? You have to determine what's effective, what's the most effective. You can't do everything, but we can do the most effective thing every single day. But we have to allocate time for that thing. So you have to prioritise so identify what it is, put it at the top, list of the priorities, that gets done first. When that gets done, I start on this. Then I do this. Then I do this. But if you haven't got that written down, it's not formalised. It's just a vague wish. Right, so we've got to get onto that. And then uh, look for uh, challenges. Mine for challenges here means dig. Dig for challenges, identify problems that are going to come up early. Look for solutions, the possible solutions early. Um, identify, call out any obstacles beforehand in the planning that's going to stop us from reaching a milestone. What are some things that could go wrong which would stop us making the time frame on that? Reward systems at various intervals of the project. This again, what I was saying before, don't save it up to the end. Have little mini celebrations on the way through. And then uh, your coach might be the team leader or mentor, okay, so that they're in the spin, they know what's going on. Now, when you look at this list, which of these things do you think are currently missing from your organization's system? What's missing? Do you think there's anything on this list that you're not doing now? These are all fairly straightforward, common sense things. There's anything missing? In your organisation, now that you're not doing, don't know where to start. Don't know where to start. Well, there you go. That says it all. I don't know where to start. Well, here's the point. Through this training, you can identify things that you need to be careful of, things you can plan for, things to take into consideration, and things that can trip you up. So, if those things aren't in place, then maybe as part of the project management, you start to make sure they are in place. So let's flip over to page 1.4, you know, 1.14, 1.14, great. Just on the first two points there, what just pick up two most useful ideas that you got from this morning so far? Just the two most useful ideas from this morning's session, okay? Any questions on that? You're good? Two most useful ideas from this morning, go. Okay, let's... Let's share some of those. What, what things came up on this table that were useful? Uh, How to empower people, yes. yes. Okay. When you're the project team, yes. What else? In delegation. Delegation was handy, yeah. How about on this table, what came up? Um, uh, empowerment uh, leads to motivation. Mm -hmm. um, planning leads to better management. Um, writing leads to more clarity and feedback leads to better delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the communication gets much, much better when that happens. How about the things that work? Um, communicating goals repeatedly. Yes, keeping the goals clear and keep telling people what the goals are. Because you've said it already. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So you said it once. Doesn't mean people have got it clearly. 
fix it in one. Yeah, what else? Sounds to me like I better come back and do that module on delegation, just look at three tables and identify that. But it is an issue, and it's an issue everywhere. It's not just your organization, trust me, it's an issue everywhere. And uh, people who are in leadership positions are really frustrated because they've got so much to do in so little time, but they're keeping a lot of the work themselves. That's why they're so busy. Mm. And uh, we have an expression, you know, rather than work in the business, work on the business, you know, so it's a little bit different viewpoint, uh, and that's where delegation frees you up to step back and work on the whole process and a lot of other things go with it. All right, in a private sector organisation where it was very flat like that, what we would say would be your ability to direct your career is directly related to the value that you bring to the organisation either this organization or any other organization. Right? So now it's no longer just your flat organization that you're talking about. You're talking about their career advancement in general terms, anyway. And the skills you'll pick up will make you more valuable to your employer, not just us, outside as well. So what you're trying to do is trigger that motivation that they then think, well, okay, yeah, I want to get involved, I want to get the experience, I want to understand how things work, so I can step up. Because just thinking you're going to keep ambitious people going in a flat organisation, I think, is very optimistic. And if you think about, well, maybe we can't take people to a high level in terms of promotion, we'll only have them for a limited period of time, perhaps, uh, but while they're here, let's have them really working extremely well and accept that they will move on because we can't offer them. My organisation is like that, it's very flat, it's very, you know, I don't have a lot of senior positions and you know, you know, people move because they are ambitious and they want to go and do something else. That's just the reality of life. That's re but you still have need for people to be motivated and maybe the motivation isn't just limited to one organisation. You don't want to lose them, of course, but the reality is you'd rather lose them and have them really work well than have them be totally demotivated and stay forever. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to project management now. Now this is going, I, I tell you, this is very, very comprehensive. All right, it's very comprehensive. We're going to go straight into, we're going to go straight to page 2.7. What I'm asking you to do here on this page is to think back and in, in, uh, in actually Japanese Zen you have this idea of beginner's mind. You go back to when you first did something and how you felt about it because if you th think as a leader of a project you may have inexperienced people in your team, they are actually beginners. But when you're experienced, you forget about that. You know, your expectations of them are too high, or your communication is too shallow, or too brief, or too quick, because you've forgotten what it was like to be in their position, at their age and stage, in their career. Right? So when we actually reflect a little bit about how it was for us, as a leader of a project, we become much better in communicating and leading our team. So this 2.7 here is asking you to go back, go back. Think about a project that was assigned to you, might be a number of years ago now, and well, look, when you got that assignment, what did you think? What were the things going through your mind? What were the things you weren't thinking about? The last thing, that means what, what did you think about? What did you anticipate? Right? What were the successes like? What were the challenges like? So I just want you to go back and be, think about when you did your first early projects, you didn't know much, didn't have a lot of experience, didn't have a lot of knowledge. 
relive that beginner's mind for a moment. Just, just take this section, just fill it out. Very bullet points, that's all, very brief. Just bullet points is fine. And let's reflect on our beginner's mind to position ourselves as leaders of a project to become better communicators to new people, to the organisation, or new to the project team, or new to this piece of the business, or new to these activities, on how they can do them. some feedback on some of these points. I'm particularly keen to hear when you first got assigned to the project either as a project leader or as a member of the project team, what was your first thoughts? When you first heard that, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? I'm not sure whether I What were you thinking? I'm not sure whether I can I'm not sure I can actually fulfil the responsibility that you're giving me. Yeah, I have, maybe I've never done this before, or I haven't done this very often, or this is, uh, sounds difficult. Yeah. How about yourself? What did you feel? Mm, sure. I, it's not the right answer, but I thought about when and what, what kind of uh, project it's going to be. It's just yeah, so you got, your mind went into the detail a little yes. bit straight away, right? Yeah. Yeah, you got straight into the detail of what this is going to involve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. General like, overview, when and where. Yeah. Yes. yeah. How about you, Nick? Um, the importance of the project and the severity of... Uh, uh, <laughs> Risk-reward. 
ratio, heavily weighted on the risk side, right? Andrew, how about you? Uh, my project was, um, yeah, it was basically kind of good because it seemed to be very complex. Yeah, this is a detailed, complicated, intricate project. Am I actually going to be able to do this successfully? Yeah, yeah. Actually, what's on the road? Um, I just wanted to know what, which role that I should do. Yeah, well, what should, how should I do this? What role should I play? How do I fit it? What were some, like, what are some things you did think about? You know, it says, what's the last thing you thought about? What that means, what didn't you think about? When you got the project, they said, okay, here's a project. Then later you realize, oh, I didn't think about that. What was the thing you didn't think about? My hand Well, it's very case specific because I thought of the project Thetis and I never, uh, it's like the biggest event of the embassy and I never thought, um, thought of how popular this event was and people start to invite themselves and it was really hard to turn them down so that was very unexpected. <laughs> Gate crashes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Richard, Max, some things you did think about. Uh, you said my project was sort of producing a sort of finished um, piece of writing for a sort of defect public, you know, or it's like a major thing, like a publication on train train things, which required getting input from a whole range of posts in the Asian region. And the thing that I did the later on I thought of that I should have just thought of far earlier was how long it would take posts to produce their work. So what we're looking at here is the things that in the planning stage are critical to anticipate at that early stage. Rather than you get into it and then you realise, uh oh, this isn't going according to what I expected, you hadn't planned for it. So we're always saying this thing. How about some of the challenges? What is when you got that first project? Tell me what were some challenges you the faced. The challenge was was <coughs> this is I had to do a bit I had to set up a visit. The challenge was getting staff and supervisors to understand they had to sell the visit to the Japanese counterparts. Right. So I had to, I had a sales job. Right. With, with, to to make sure we got the best Japanese counterparts, right. and and my I had to sell. That was the biggest challenge was selling. It was internal. It was internal selling it to my team before I I could sell it outside. And you know what? That is what happens in industry as well. We have a big client, they're a sporting goods manufacturer, and we do training for their marketing team on presentation skills because they choose the colours and the styles of the, the sports clothing and the shoes and all that sort of stuff. You know. yeah, but who gets to sell it? The sales team. So what does the sales team do? They complain. Oh, you didn't pick well, or it would be impossible to sell this and they win. So the marketing team has to be very persuasive to get them on board to get behind the selection and what's the project that's going on. So this is not just in your area. This is across the board. This comes up all the time. How to get people to sign in. Alex, how about for you? Um, I was negotiating with the Chinese government and it was, the, China, the rules were very different from the Chinese You had two regulatory institutions squeezing you in the middle, one the lawyers and the other being the rules. Right? And this is often the case. You know? We have any well, I mean, any time in business, the lawyers get involved, there's an immediate, here's the deal breaker right here. You know, you've got the, the people trying to make something happen, lawyers get involved, their job, make nothing happen. So this is very common, very, very common. So these are sorts of things that can be very challenging in the project. So on the next page, here is a brilliant checklist for you. Brilliant checklist for you. Before you start the project, right at the very outset, if you just, everyone went through this as the first thing they could look at, this would get people really thinking, well, you know, 
What's the purpose? And we break that down into four things. Well, why is this a project at all? Now, it's very typical that people at the top know the why. And it's very typical that it comes down as far as middle management. But it's also very typical that it doesn't go below middle management. Middle management are on the phone calls, the conference calls, they're in the meeting room when these things are discussed, they get access to reports, they have access to certain emails, they get a lot of information, they suck it up and then they don't pass it up. They all come.